Hello, Dominic here from the Bournemouth Writing Festival. Welcome to another interview with a local writer, author or writing professional. And I'm trying to release one of these every Monday evening for the next few weeks. So if you would like to be notified in your inbox of the next interview, then hit the subscribe button, which is somewhere along the bottom there. So today I'm absolutely delighted to welcome Patrick Lezimont. And Patrick is a huge supporter of the Writing Festival. He comes along to our networking events and comes along to the festival and all sorts. And um, I have actually uh, read one of his books. So I'm delighted to speak to him in a little bit more detail about his writing journey. So welcome, Patrick. Hi there, everyone. Thanks very much for having me, Dominic. I'm, I'm looking forward to this. No problem at all. So Patrick, you used to work in advertising many years ago, and now you have four published books under the um, Jocks McNabb series, and they're all kind of World War II historical novels. So tell me, how did you go from being in advertising to being a published author? Sure, yeah, yeah. Um, okay, so I mean, I um, went to university in Scotland, um, and because my father was from Belgium, I actually got called up to do military service way back in the, uh, in the 80s giving my age away there um and so i joined the the air force um and i was in military intelligence um so i kind of got a bit of a taster um uh to the air force um i then i went to london um, and joined various advertising agencies and had a 30-year career working for some of the biggest baddest you know ad agencies out there um yeah it was great it was lots of fun lots of celebrities lots of yeah the, kind of the rock and roll of advertising um by the time i was about late 40s um uh, covid came along um obviously we had a lot plenty of time on our hands and we were at home and i decided i'm gonna have a go as a writing lark um so first lockdown i wrote one book second lockdown i wrote a second book it's worth saying the first book was terrible it was 170,000 words long um and then i actually got the opportunity to enter a, com a contest a competition um and i won that um, and the brief there was to write World War II aviation thrillers. And so I just basically went for it and sort of, you know, you, you, you show me my, the first one. Actually, as you, as you can see here, I've got four. Um, and yeah, so I'm sort of on a roll. And uh, interestingly, my second book um, called The Brookwood Boys, um, which I wrote in second lockdown, that's actually coming out in October now. I want to come back to that book um, a little bit later, Patrick, but did you, you didn't just kind of decide to stop advertising and just write novels. Did you kind of write like in between, like when you were at school or you like, and, and you, you know, lockdown wasn't that long ago and you've got five books out. So, you know, what's, yeah, your, what's, your, training? what's your kind of background? Yeah, I mean, uh, the honest answer is, is no. Um, I always had this idea for the first book, um, which is due to come out next year, um, working title, Yesterday Soldier, but I had, the idea for a long time. And I did talk to some clients about it and so forth. And I remember one slightly odd client of mine said, hey, the, the, the color of your aura changed when you told me that story. And I said, mm, that's a bit odd. But the point is actually, I had time on my hands and so I just got stuck in. It's also perhaps worth saying that advertising, I mean, you're a marketer, you know this a little bit, is that, you know, when you become kind of old, old male and stale, actually advertising is not so keen on you. And so therefore it was kind of a bit of a, a crossroads for me. and. It's kind of my nature. I'm a bit of a sort of charge at it, thick skinned, kind of bull in the china shop kind of character. So I just went for it. I didn't really know what I was doing. Um, thankfully, now it's going to be in decent shape. Um, but that book is going to come out. But you know, over time, you get better. You take some classes. You you if you join some um, um, writing groups and so forth, which I did in Surrey, where we lived. And then two years ago, we moved down to Bournemouth principally because I no longer needed to commute out of Heathrow and I no longer needed London and it was an opportunity to move down to the seaside. Um, so we made the move, um, of, you know, myself, my wife, my two daughters. Um, and then I'm trying to make a go of this, of this writing, um, Lark. It's, it's doing okay, you know. Thankfully, I've got a pension too. Um, but yeah, no, okay, you know, so I think, you know, I mean, if you want some stats, um, over the last, uh, over the first three books since April, um, uh, sorry, since the last three books, um, it sold 40,000 books um, over a year and a half, and that's over 7 million pages read. So it's getting there. It's getting there. Wow. I mean, that is incredible. Um, let me just go back a, a little bit to the to the genre that you write in, which is kind of historical World War II. 
Um, and you know what I noticed about your book is, is it is incredibly detailed in terms of the um, of the the kind of facts of World War Two. So, how did you go about your research? Did you enjoy it? You know, where did you get that interest from? Um, I've always been quite meticulous about research. You know, in advertising, you need to try to understand how people think and what motivates them and what um, extenuating circumstances are which will actually affect their behavior. So that's kind of the way I go in. I don't think I'm a particularly good archivist. I just, you know, I just make this stuff up. Um, I'm, I've always been interested in war films. I've always been interested in these kind of stories. Um, yes, Jocks McNabb is World War II aviation. And I do put, you know, with a, with a typical author's conceit, I do put a bit of myself in there. So he went to the same boarding school as I did. Um, I name dropped lots of pals and stuff like that. In fact, watch out, you might end up in one of the stories. Um, so, I research is important, but actually it's just stuff that I do and I look and, and, and you know the internet is wonderful and you know so I'm talking about describing about flying over Malta over mountains and stuff like that. Clearly I've never done that. I just look on Google Maps and just make it up. And and that's I think that's the important thing. Um is that is that as a writer, it's about your imagination and basically telling the story. And it's not so much about the facts, although thank you for saying that most of the facts uh, are, are, are evident. And it's worth saying this is a slightly dangerous world for me to, to, to be writing in because they are what I call the rivet counters, um, who are guys who are really into this even more than me and will come back and tell me that I've got this wrong or that wrong. And actually I'm happy with that because that means they've engaged with the story and they want to actually chat. And I always reply, I always you know, plan to change um, the, the books as, 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 as they request. And actually that's made, made the books quite sticky if you want. Um, and obviously with a series that helps. In fact, I was going to ask you about uh, people that fact checked <laughs> and say, well, you got that wrong or you got that squadron wrong or whatever. But it sounds like you take it on the chin, you know, and actually it helps you to develop the next books, I suppose. Totally. Um, I mean, one of the things which is particularly important is that, I mean, I, I'm not a pilot. I can't fly. I don't know one end of a thing. So actually, yes, there's lots of stuff out there and they are a huge number of 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 biographies and autobiographies of, by various pilots and spitfire guys and so on. so i use that you know um and uh um I've, I've had lots of guys actually say this guy really knows how to fly um you know he he, he looks like he was there and all this so maybe they don't know how old i am or whatever comparatively but clearly i wasn't um so i take that as a compliment and and so you know i think the key skill is to be a storyteller a compelling storyteller rather necessarily a sort of technician um, and i think perhaps in this particular genre sometimes there's a, a tendency to sort of sink into that i mean you, you, you know you only need to look at uh, you know some of these thriller writers where they talk about the uh, 7627 magged blah 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 and you sort of think oh, okay really um, anyway and i think there is a fine line there between facts and creative license you know the all you know like all films titanic for example they always say well that was wrong but you know let's have some creative freedom and as you said make it up because sometimes the imagination makes better stories <laughs> i mean one of the things i'd like to try to do is to actually take real people and populate my story with it and so people uh, and, and my readers have actually quite appreciated that um the one sort of get out of jail card is um, at the end of the book i always have quite a a lengthy historical note and the thing that i do have to do is to play around with the timelines a little bit because otherwise jocks can't be everywhere doing all these things i mean you know as it is in, i'm writing book five at the moment and he's probably like 23 or something now and he's been like in about 17 battles and stuff um but again that's no difference from you know sharpie or or um, um in, in patrick o'brien books or whatever these guys have to survive and tell the story and have to have buddies and stuff um but yeah so it's, it's good fun so talk to me about Jocks McNabb, who is your main character. So you've got four books out already. Um, and yep. by the way, they're published by Superior Books. Um, so did you go to them with, or did you have in your head, you know, this is a character which can run and run. And, you know, you kind of had four or five okay. or four books in your head already, or have you just kind of, you know, and, and I suppose, where did the inspiration for Jocks come from? Okay, well, that's a very good story, uh, very good question. Um, and in fact, I did share on the Bournemouth writing festival site um Saperi books actually um i guess specialize in in series and they actually ran this competition where you had to write the first three chapters um write an sort of outline of the first five books um and then a synopsis of the first book right and on the back of that i won the aviation section um interestingly um as i said I, they've run it again the competition again and actually they're about to announce the uh, the next set of winners 
Um, and I did actually put that on the Bournemouth Writing Festival um, website. And, and funnily enough, there's a friend of mine who is from a writing group. He actually applied and has actually won, and he's going to be writing naval thrillers. Um, so so it's, it's kind of a slightly unorthodox way of doing things, but I think it really works because you kind of know what you've got to do. And then, I mean, interestingly, actually, there's two other, uh, two other authors who responded to the same brief as I did, and their stories are completely different, but the only commonality being aviation, Second World War, go. Um, um, the inspiration for jocks, well, I've got a very good friend called Jeremy Brown, um, who in my mind's eye is what he looks like. Um, we used to call him jockey. Um, I used to run a, a, one of my first little attempts at being an entrepreneur was uh, um, um, uh, a boxer short company called Jocks Box. Um, and so I put the two of them together, I stuck them in the same school as me. Um, he got, he got, yeah, basically left school because he got caught in the pub like me. And off we go. And so, as I say, um, with the with the author's um, conceit, there's a bit of me in there, but there's lots of other friends in there. Um, and I do try to picture someone every time when I'm writing a character, because I think it's important to get the characterization full and rich. And I have been complimented on that. So, yeah. Brilliant. So um, one thing I wanted to ask you about um, about your kind of publishing history but you kind of explained a little bit so your your entry into the publishing world was through a competition so was that directly through that particular publisher or did you have an agent or you know how, how did you go about getting oh. your book from the the page to, to yeah. the cool copy yeah okay so the publishers um superior books they're um what they call digital first which is where they, they, they live most significantly sort of um, um on um on um Kindle and and KDP and, and pages and so, but they also they obviously do um, paperbacks too. Um, my first two books were standalone books, and I basically pumped them at agents, thousands of agents, hundreds of agents, like we all have. And you know, I think yeah, I got some like five or six fulls, um, particularly on the second book. And as um, yeah, as you mentioned, uh, as I mentioned, that's a you know, it, that, that's not coming in October. Um, so I tried the, the more conventional approach with the trad, with the trad route with agents. You know, got some okay, but I think part of the problem is that is that um, it, this is although forty percent of my readers are women, this is a slightly male thing, and I do think that publishing is quite um, female focused and female led, um, and an all guy like me writing war stories is perhaps not as, as as cool as it could be that said there is a huge audience for this and i think that's one of the things which is very very important is that you now it's uh, you know i'd recommend to authors is think about your genre and really go for it um i think it's really hard to write crime i think it's really hard to write romance not because the stories are difficult but because there's so damn many of them out there um i've had a couple of author friends quite quite successful ones you know there's a whole bunch of them who write viking and roman stories and stuff like that and one of them basically bought my books for his father who was a spitfire pilot and said i didn't even know this was a genre he says well of course it is it's gone a little bit quiet because in the 70s and 80s and stuff you'll remember there was loads of them um you know, you know len dayton if you if you're interested in, this, in, in, in interested in this kind of thing you know we know len dayton for being spies spy stories but his world war ii stories are absolutely fantastic um i'm reading one now called bomber Anyway, um, so that's how I, how it sort of happened. And, and that's the thing, and that's one of the uh, 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 kind of consistent piece of advice we get at the writing festival, uh, particularly in the self-publishing talks, is about finding your niche. And you don't have to please every single person. If you can find your niche, and you've obviously done that very well, so you kind of almost have a, an engaged audience that when you're doing a next one, that you've got a, you've got a, an audience there ready waiting, kind of. For your next Absolutely. One. Absolutely. And there's two things I'd say about that is one, um, as a as an author who's starting to get his mojo going a bit, um, actually, uh, pre orders are a wonderful thing. Because, you know, the day you push the button, boom, there's this number that appears. And so that's great. Um, I do have something like I can't remember off the top of my head, but I think it's something like 800 people that follow me on Amazon, um, who basically are buying my book. So that's kind of interesting. Um, um, but I mean, my next book that's coming out in October is actually a ghost story. So it's a slightly different genre. Yes, it's military cemetery ghosts. So it's going to be interesting how that goes. But I'm kind of hoping that's going to be my breakout book. But we'll see. We'll see. I'm going to ask you about that in just a second. Sure. Um, so Patrick, but even before you got into the world of advertising, you, you're you the son of a, of a couple of diplomats. So you traveled around the world in your in your youth and you say you lived in over 20 countries um, and you, you're a person of color. Um, so tell us about 
um, that tapestry of cultures um, sure. that informed your writing? Um, so my father was from Belgium. Uh, my mother is from Thailand. Uh, I was born in Taiwan. So you can imagine a boarding school being made in Taiwan was, was great. Um, um, and uh, um, my father worked for the United Nations. Um, and he had a very interesting life uh, all around the world. I mean, in fact, I went on a course at AUB um, to write memoirs. And um, I've sort of had a start at that. And that's going to be called Made in Taiwan. And that's going to be the story of my childhood all around the world. But I mean, I lived in, I lived in Vietnam as a boy um, before the fall of Saigon. I lived in Iran um, um, at the start of the Islamic Revolution. Um, and after all that turbulence, I was actually then packed off to boarding school at the age of 11 or 12 um, and then Scotland became home and that, that's kind of where my Scottishness kind of grew um, but yeah so you know I've been many many cultures many many schools um, my I've got two sisters one who lives in Germany the other one who lives in Switzerland my younger sister works the UN as well as does her husband um, so yeah we've been a real sort of international crew um, um, and uh, yeah so how does that how would you think that has like consciously or subconsciously affected your writing? Um, okay, well, one of the things I, I, I do is I basically put characters of all different classes and, 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 and origins and nations in my stories. As the war progresses, um, to start with, it was the Brits and then the Canadians and the, and the, and the Australians and the Kiwis. And so so it, was, it was actually quite kind of white. But as the war became more intensified than the Poles, um, the Czechs, the Belgians, the French, uh, the, the Indians, the, the Caribbeans all started getting involved. And I like to tell those stories. So in my book uh, three, I have Jock stuck in the, in the desert at the Battle of El Alamein, and he basically is beside a, a Sikh soldier who's had his leg blown off. And, and so, you know, so there's a lot of cultural stories. I'm writing now about about the partisans in Italy. And again, there's another Sikh soldier I've got there, a real guy called Sad Singh, um, who is quite an inspirational character. So I, I'm, I try to tell the story of a world war with the emphasis on world. Um, um, I think, you know, we often look at those conflicts and those stories through, you know, um, a sort of a, a Western European um, um, optic. And I think that's a real shame. Um, my first book that I wrote actually is, is about previous lives and, and, and it basically is peoples of, of different nations, all soldiers. Um, and so I try to basically tell the story of conflict from an unexpected perspective. Okay, great. Let's chat about your latest book. Um, so I, I think I'm writing this one was a few years ago, you know, you wrote it quite a few years ago. Was this the one that was long listed for the uh, Morley Prize for Unpublished um, Authors of Colour? That's right. That's right. Um, um, it was um, written in second lockdown, and one of the few places I could go to and visit and get some air um, w when we lived in Surrey was Brookwood Cemetery, which is um, not not that many people know that much about it, but it's actually the largest military cemetery uh, um, in the UK, and that is also within the largest cemetery in Western Europe. So it's a huge thing. The original idea for Brookwood Cemetery was that all of London's dead would basically be shipped out there, right? So, I mean, it's a vast, vast thing. Um, and it's, uh, you know, Victorian, Edwardian, there's lots and lots of um, 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 religions, lots of different um, um, uh, nations and origins, you know, so for example, there's huge Zoroastrian temples there um, where allegedly um, Freddie Mercury may be buried there with his grandparents. Um, and then even in, in, in a military cemetery, there's Americans, lots and lots of Canadians, Brits, French, Belgians. I mean, they're all there. And so I used to walk around there. Um, and then one time I walked with my with my wife and, and, and my dear friend, Carrie. Um, and then this idea started percolating through about, well, this is basically just row after row of stories of characters. And if some of them actually sort of stayed around, you know, they would have traumas because they're all there for them from the war. Many of them were enemies, you know, because there's Germans there as well. And then so you start digging, you start digging, and um, and then the story emerged. Um, and yeah, so my main character is a guy called um, Miles Forsyth. He's from Tennessee. He's got a very particular way of speaking, a bit deputy dog like that. Um, and so that has to be communicated through. Um, and he's he was one of the first buried there, um, um, an unknown soldier, because again, there's this, well, again, the, in my story, there's this implicit racism in there that they wouldn't bury 
you know, sort of an African American as the first person there, but he's there. And because he's the oldest and he's been there the longest, he then becomes like the caretaker of the souls, the good, the bad, the mad, and the inside. Um, and that kind of unfolds. But then one day, uh, there's a young boy who inexplicably can see him and can speak with him. And then the story starts. So what's interesting about that character Mouse is that he's Af um, African American. So as a white kind of um, Belgium slash Thai man, how did you kind of get into the head, the mindset of an African American? And are you worried at all about um, kind of people talking about that? Yeah, I mean, I, I, that's really interesting. And then, you know, as, as we talked about earlier, I'm a little bit nervous, but actually, I kind of want to prove the point. I mean, authors are about imagination. There's so many great stories about people writing about characters, different you know, genders, uh, different nations. Uh, um, in Remains of the Day, in, written by a Japanese American, um, an English Japanese chap. Um, um, so I hope it'll be okay. You know, we shall see. I mean, as I mentioned to you earlier on, it's kind of it was, it was released two, three days ago, and it's like number one on the number one newest releases in African American history or something. So, you know, maybe I'm kind of walking a slightly dangerous line, but actually, no, I, I love it. It's worth saying that he is the narrator, but it's not just his story. Within the story, there are uh, all the other characters. His best friend is a Polish um, you know, you know, fighter. Um, but there are there are some really dark stories in, in, uh, in, in Brookwood and in, in, in general. Like, so for example, Brookwood was, was where all the um, the U.S. Army's uh, executed criminals were buried, right? Um, and they, at the end of the war, they were dug up and they were shipped over to France. But what is very disturbing, or certainly to me, I think disturbing to anyone, is that out of something like 18 of them, so I think, yeah, 18 of them, 16 of them are black, right? So how on earth is that possible? Um, but that was kind of a reflection of, the, of that time. Um, there are other stories about you know the the, the Canadians at Jep. Um, there's also a Slapton Sands. There was a disaster that happened before D-Day, where over over a thousand Americans were killed um, down in Devon, um, uh, blue on blue, um, and no one talks about them. It's all a big hush secret. Um, they were buried there and they were shipped off. Anyway, there's so many stories there, and that's that's why I think the book is 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 is, is great. Which leads me myself. to which leads me into my last question, Patrick, which is what what's next? What's your future? Is it is it kind of keep finding stories? Are you looking at other genres? What what's the dream? Yeah, that's interesting. I mean, I I I'm actually contracted with Superior to, to write 10 books, right? So the two standalones and eight Jocks McNabs, and I'm I'm writing the fifth one now. So I'm sort of full till 2026. Um, I'm trying to get two stroke three books out a year because i want to get the, you know the head of steam and i you know so maybe it's worth saying a little, a little bit about that so my my sort of modus operandi is um aim for a thousand or twelve hundred words a day a minimum of five thousand a week right and then basically chunk your way through and then have three or four drafts and then hopefully it sticks when you send it to the editor um don't be too precious don't agonize too much about stuff um that's one of the things i think you know as, as, as writers and authors we kind of are in our heads too much um, um actually once you have the reassurance that actually you know, you're all right people do quite like this and so therefore you kind of know what you're doing ish then you just go for it so um, do those book my books have a formula then no not at all no i mean they have a history or you, you know the war um and I'm, you know, th th that leads into the question of um, your panster or plotter. Um, I, where is it? I have a sort of a two pages of A4. So this is my my current book, and it's got up to chapter 28. Um, and basically, it has just like three lines for each chapter, more or less what I want. Of course, it changes, um, and then you just chunk your way through it. Um, and of course, I have the war and I have certain events I want to get in, certain interesting things. And then for the rest of it, it's like, just make it up. <laughs> Brilliant. Well, thank you um, so much uh, for joining me today. So that's uh, Patrick Larsimont. And um, check out his uh, book series, Jock Manab. Uh, it's on Amazon. It's on his website. Uh, the website's going to be in the in the post uh, linking to this um, 
uh, this video. So um, thank you so much, Patrick, for joining us today. Great stuff. Thanks very much, Dominic. Listen, you're doing a great thing with this writing festival and I'll see you at the networking thing tonight. Oh, thank you so much. Um, and for the rest of you, thank you so much for joining us today. Um, and yeah, look forward to seeing you at the next one. Again, don't forget to subscribe along the bottom and the next interview will pop into your inbox when it's released. So thank you so much and take care. See you soon. Bye.